Welcome to the This Is Horror podcast. I'm your host, Michael David Wilson. I'm joined as always by my co-host, Bob Pastorella. How's it going, Bob? It's going good. Very good, Michael. How are you doing this morning or this evening for you? So good, thank you. We've just got off the call with Alistair Stewart of Pseudopod, and it was a fascinating conversation. We had Dan Howarth with us on co-hosting duties, and I mean, we not only got deep into the history of Pseudopod, but we spoke at length about podcasting, about writing, about the audio form of storytelling. I think there's a tremendous amount for our listeners to unpack. And I think it's going to be a very detailed, filled episode. An episode that's going to be helpful for writers of audio, for writers of fiction, for writers generally. It's it's coming from a different a different approach than what we normally have. We have somebody who, who deals, deals in story, deals in the actual narration of the story and the, the way that you tell a story. So I think that, you know, it, coming from a different angle like that, we always want to explore different, different writing perspectives, how that can affect your writing and things like that. So it, definitely, I think people are going to love this. It's going to be awesome. Yeah. Well, before we get on with the interview, a quick word from our sponsors. Melvin sees monsters with tentacles and teeth. Kids bullying him, and now he's dead. Something's happening to the teenagers of Linwood High School. Is it cult forming, or is it just rumors? Patrick Lacey's We Came Back, published on Sinister Grim Press in paperback and ebook on April 15th. Author Christopher Rufty says it's one of the best books I've read in years. Purchase We Came Back today from online retailers and check out all the horror, science fiction, and fantasy works from Sinister Grin Press. Horror and more that'll cover a smile on your face. www.sinistergrinpress.com Massive reptilian monsters have begun to emerge from Mexico's volcanoes, wreaking havoc on city after city. Now the nation's only hope is for physicist Elena Bass and anthropologist Alfonso Becerra to overcome their long-standing feud and work together. For only a blend of science and myth can save Mexico from the ancient lords of the earth. Available in ebook and paperback from Severed Press, Lords of the Earth is a harrowing Mexican kaiju novel from award-winning writer David Bowles. All right, so I believe, Bob, that you have Alistair's bio. Yes, I do. Alistair Stewart is the owner of Escape Artist, Inc., as well as the host of Pseudopod and the co-host of Escape Pod. His work has appeared in The Guardian, How It Works, The 14 Times, Sci-Fi Now, and Neo. He blogs for SFX and Bleeding Cool and has a running blog at Tor.com. And I believe that you can find him at AlistairStewart.com. All right. Well, with that said, let's do it. Let's get Alistair Stewart on the This Is Horror podcast. Let's do it. And now for a horror interview. Alistair, welcome to the This Is Horror podcast. Hi there, thanks very much for having me on. I know, to begin with, if we could talk a little bit about your first experiences with story, whether reading or writing. Yeah, of course. And this is really weird for, for a guy who hosts a horror show. My two formative experiences with story were um, 2010 by Arthur C. Clarke uh, and... So the late great games master starring Sir Patrick Moore's science fiction novels and um, I, I kind of came to both of them in a very weird way Moore's SF novels starring Scott Saunders astronaut because everyone knows true heroes have alliterative names <laughs> uh, were very kind of science based and near future and looking at a lot of the SF I naturally gravitate to even now it's pretty much all that. I mean, I um, the first TV show to hit me straight between the frontal lobes was Star Cops, which the BBC ran in the very late 80s and played like one of those things which has fallen through a hole in time from 15 years in the future. I it, firmly believe it was a TV show made very, very, very much too early because it was very ambitious and very smart and 
in the 1980s, the closest you could do get to convincing zero-G technology was everyone having suspiciously padded bums and always moving in exactly the right way. But that kind of very near future, very plausible grounded SF is what Moore did. And I really liked that. And then a few years later, um, I, I had that contractually obliged moment pretty much everybody gets when you're a kid where uh, <laughs> you're basically sat down and told, you're going to be in hospital for a couple of days. And by this point, I was together enough to, to go, okay, I'm going to need some coloring books and a book and some comics. And uh, the book I took in was um, 2010. And that, again, again, it's that kind of very similar grounded science fiction thing. Really, really kind of grabbed me. My first conscious experience of horror as story on the radio. I went I went through this this very extended phase where my sleeping pattern, even as even as a child, was quite weird. I would be usually be awake between about eleven and and uh, one a.m. Certainly on the weekends. In the week it was a little easier, and as a result of that, I got very used to that final hour on BBC Radio Four, which is usually half an hour of sitcom and half an hour of you know what, let's just do something weird. And that was where I first found Fear on 4. Uh, Fear on 4 is, I think, in its fourth iteration now. Maybe it's third. And the premise for it is a mysterious, possibly supernatural figure called the Man in Black. And it would be many years before I realized that, you know, this was also something, this was also a name Johnny Cash would have, presents a spooky story. So he shows up, he gives a little intro, you get a 25-minute forecast audio drama, and he then does a cute little wrap up at the end which is kind of my job now mm. i i love these there there is one and i must have heard this 25 years ago there's one about a british tourist on holiday i think in spain and there is a, a legend surrounding a tower nearby where you know it's it's one of those places where it's like the steps in whitby and you can never count all the steps successfully because if you do something awful will happen and of course she counts the steps successfully, and of course, something awful happens. And it's established early on in the episode. There's about three, four hundred steps in this thing. And the last thing you hear is this woman sobbing with fear, counting past a thousand, and the sound of her going down these, this eternal flight of steps. And I did not sleep very much that night. <laughs> so that was really my first experience with horror, uh, or rather with story in the form of horror. And around the same time, this was the early 90s, which was a period where UK comic publishers had absolutely no idea quite what they wanted to do. So they would often, uh, with the obvious exception of 2000 AD, they would often just kind of bundle up US titles and reprint them and kind of hope for the best. And this is how, somehow, for five deeply glorious months, um, Hellblazer, the John Constantine series was available in newsagents in the UK, stocked with children's comics. This was not wise, but I did find these <laughs> when they were stocked. And there is one particular story. And I think it's one of the only two times Grant Morrison wrote the character, which combines a pagan ritual in a small village in the exact middle of England. Like the first panel you see is John standing on under one of those signs where there's an arrow pointing one way that says, the north, and an arrow pointing the other way that says the south. Uh, and this pagan ritual is combined with a newly arrived batch of nuclear missiles at the U.S. Air Force Base, just outside town. And this thing is horrible in truly brilliant ways. And again, I think I, I was, I, I must have been like 13, 14 when I read it. And you know that thing where you interact with a, a story that, that is Kind of, that kind of plugs into you a little bit. You can feel it reprogramming how you view stuff. Very much had that. So, I, yeah, my, my, my early kind of interactions with story in horror would be uh, Fear on 4 and Hellblazer. And my earliest interactions with story would be 2010 and uh, probably Star Cops. In terms of writing it, I, I kind of had two, ex again, kind of had two experiences with that. Uh, I went through a phase... Uh, in my mid-teens, where I had decided that I was going to write the next version of NYPD Blue. And I had watched a lot of Blade Runner at this point. 
I mean, a lot. I mean, we had rented it, I think, every second week for about a year. I developed this whole series of uh, kind of near future, vaguely science fiction, slightly cyberpunk pop stories. And I mean, I was 14. They were terrible. They weren't quite as bad as the um, adventure in space stories I'd written three years previously, where I really hadn't quite got around the idea that upper and lower case were both things I should be using. But uh, they were, you know, the, the cop stories were a playground. And I mean, the final couple were approaching quite fun. Uh, and those taught me an awful lot. They, they taught me a lot about the kind of stories I respond to. And they taught me a lot about story architecture. Strangely, again, story architecture is kind of the other half of the day job these days with the, the tabletop RPG stuff I write. So I've, I've interacted with story in various genres in a lot of very odd ways. I want to go back to Hellblazer being stocked with children's comics because that, re <laughs> that really stood out. Do you, do you remember any of the children's comics that it was alongside? I mean, I'm wondering what age people might have inadvertently picked up Hellblazer. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was this whole string at the time, and it's, it's kind of what W.H. Smith took over a few years ago and made slightly more respectable of bundled US reprints. So you get like three issues of Batman or, you know, a, a Transformers tie-in comic and this kind of thing. And yeah, there was, I, I think it was called Oink. I want to say it was called Oink. There, there are like about three or four of those. Comics aren't just for kids anymore. So we'll stack them next to the Beano and traumatize a generation <laughs> things that hit in the space of about two years. And uh, th th that was very much one of them. Uh, around the same time, Actually, Marvel UK briefly had this brilliant flourish of originality where they were producing their own book. One of which, Knights of Pendragon, remains one of the great unreprinted classics of Western comics. And again, this was stock bottom shelf every news agent. And uh, it was this really weird sort of Captain Britain spin-off, which opened with um, Chief Inspector Di Thomas, who is Captain Britain's kind of middle-aged, overweight, stereotypical Welsh copper sidekick who starts having recurrent dreams about Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. At the same time, an imaginatively horrific set of murders are being carried out. Di and uh, Kate McClellan, a uh, photojournalist, and Captain Britain and Union Jack, the working class Captain Britain, but God forbid we should have the class system, all get drawn into the same orbit as one another. It becomes this really really strange kind of feral retelling of the King Arthur myth. And that was fantastic. And again, like I say, this was, I think, £1.50 an issue. And the murder at the end of the first issue is a guy who's been using pesticides on his strawberry figs, who has been uh, basically rendered down into fist-sized lumps of meat and stored in a pyramid of strawberry planets. And I was... <laughs> yeah, I found it on Amazon. It looks like it's uh, number 25... Available for your Kindle and through Comixology for a dollar ninety nine. Oh, fantastic! <laughs> yeah, but uh, just just going through and looking at like at the third panel, I've seen that picture, you know, north and south. Yeah. So, and I believe it might be included in the trade rare cuts because that's got stories by both Jamie and Grant in there. Yeah, that might. I know my that. Point. that. <laughs> My, my, my former comic retailer sense is pinging a little bit there. I think you're right. I mean, I can see how, because you mentioned the BBC Radio 4 uh, program, Fear on 4, and I can see how that obviously directly linked into starting up Pseudopod. So, I mean, <laughs> was audio always one of your preferred mediums for story? To interact with? Absolutely. Uh, I And again, I mean, I was coming up in, in a lot of ways absolutely the right time because, as, as you probably know, there is this kind of desolate, barren wasteland of about 15 years in the UK where genre fiction was the occasional comedy extra episode of Doctor Who that Comic Relief would do. A couple of Terry Pratchett adaptations, uh, a show called The Last Train, and, and that was pretty much it. Aside, weirdly, from radio. 
where there were quite regularly kind of really very good adaptations of classic horror and SF short stories. And the work of a gentleman called Dirk Maggs. And Dirk, I, I firmly believe, is one of the unsung heroes of British genre fiction because throughout the early 90s, he somehow got to the point where Radio 1, in particular, were paying him regularly to do full cast audio dramas. Dirk did an adaptation of Nightfall, the Batman story where he gets his back broken by Bane. Um, he did, the, I think, The Life and Death of Superman. And brilliantly, and this is one of those things I am still genuinely amazed actually happened, Dirk did a side story, a canonical side story, no less, to the original Independence Day. If you remember, there was a moment in towards the, the end of, of Independence Day, in the, mo the montage where the kind of plan is sent via Morse code around the world. And there's a couple of British tornado pilots in, I think, Bahrain. And they have two lines, and it is legitimately my favorite moment in, in the whole movie, where one of them comes over and goes, what's going on? The Yanks have a plan. About bloody time. And it's like, the only thing they're missing is handlebar moustaches and scarves with wires in them. They are the most beautifully stereotypical British fighter pilots of all time. And what Dirk did was somehow take this three seconds of footage and go, I wonder how those guys got there. And ID4 UK is the story of how those two fighter pilots end up in uh, so it's either Bahrain or Egypt, which somehow starts with them being part of the recon flight over the saucer that destroys London, with, weirdly... Sir Patrick Moore, as himself, in the back seat of one of the, the two planes, and then finishes where they, they are in the uh, movie. And it's exuberant and more than a little silly and kind of brilliant in a really, really pulpy way. And Dirk's stuff was kind of a lifeline for me throughout that period of my, of my life, where every 18 months or so, just as I was starting to go, you know what? Maybe this decade-long Jane Austen adaptation marathon on the BBC is a good idea. Maybe I should, maybe I should just give up. Maybe I should just watch costume dramas. That's all there is. That's all there ever is. That and soap operas built as communist propaganda twenty years previously, which have somehow gone viral and no longer know how to die. And then one of Dirk's things would show up, and and I, <laughs> I'd listen to it and go, "I have hope again." Um, so yeah, as a listener. Or as, a, as someone who interacted with story through it, audio was a very, very big deal for me when I was coming up. And that transitioned across with podcasting quite easily. My, the first podcast I ever listened to was, I think, suitable. I remember downloading the first episode on a 56K dial-up connection that had to be plugged into the wall. And I didn't have a podcatcher, so it was loading in as a quick time movie, and it took about 25 minutes. Mm. It was absolutely worth it. What What and did you say I, the name was? Sorry, your audio kind of faded out when you were talking about the first podcast that you downloaded. Oh, it was Pseudopod. It was oh, the first okay. episode of Pseudopod. Ah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. And and I I was hooked, and I bounced from that to Escape Pod, and picked up uh, variant frequencies, who were active at that time as well, and loved it because it spoke entirely to that part of my brain that have been active since I was a teenager who really liked hearing scary stories on the radio. And um, Pseudopod were, were around about a year before Mer Lafferty stepped away. And in a very rare moment of confidence at that time, I emailed Steve Ely and went, you should tag me in. I'd be dead good. And he went, yeah, all right. <laughs> Literally. I, I think that the, the, the response I had back was, I've been meaning to talk to you about that, actually. And 10 years later, here I am. Yeah, I mean... What was that like when, you know, you said, yes, though, maybe you want to take me on? <laughs> and the response is, yeah, OK. My, my day job then, as now, is uh, for the most, most part, is I'm a freelancer. I write or record for whoever wants me. And the weird thing about that is a lot of the time every day is your first day. I mean, I, when I was first starting out, I had a couple of clients who I would work with on a monthly basis. But I had to pitch to every single month like it was my first day, you know. Uh, and, I mean, these were people I talked to on the phone two or three times a week, and I'd still have to go, hi, I'm Alistair, I've done this for you, blah, blah, blah. And when you do that, stability becomes kind of a questing beast. It becomes something that you desperately want, and it sometimes feels like you don't have. So when this opportunity came up, I thought, what the hell? And when 
he said yes. After I'd finished dancing around the room, it struck me that I now had exactly what I was looking for. And I should maybe, you know, learn how to do this. So if you go back and listen to my first two or three episodes, I sound terrified. The, the metaphor I always use is the moment at the end of Hackers where Matthew Lillard's character realizes he's speaking out of every microphone on the planet. That's what I sound like. <laughs> you know, my voice broke again. It's like, hi, welcome to, to, oh God, you know. And over time that changed, but I, I learned on the job. And that was very hard, but actually made it even more fun. Well, if you think about it, as a gimmick, I mean, if the listeners hear that the host is terrified, they might be thinking, holy fucking shit, what is it that we're about to hear now? I mean, if this guy is freaking out, what is going to happen to us? <laughs> it's funny you should mention that. Um, one of the first narrations I did was a Flash story called Why, for Why I Hate Cake. And it's, it's a lovely, lovely story, and it's presented absolutely as dialogue. And I was recording this. I was late. Uh, you know, I think it was go, had to go live the next day. And I was recording this on the way out to the dentist. And I'm, I'm Lantern George. I have a size 18 head and a size 20 bottom jaw. So no nerve down there is in quite the right place. So I'm, I'm very, very hard to anesthetize in that particular area. So I, I'm no fan of the dentist. And I had about 20 minutes. Uh, it's only like a 10-minute story. I had about 20, 20 minutes. Before I was heading out. So I thought, okay, got to do it. Pull my end cap up. Somehow completely forgot the boilerplate on the front of it. So the thing actually opens with, <sighs> why I hate cake. <laughs> and it just, it goes in absolutely straight. And I, by the time I'd, I'd come back from the dentist, I had an email from Ben, the editor at that point, going, I don't know why you did this, but it's brilliant. We're not going to put any of the boilerplate on the front. We'll just play it as is. Because I sound thoroughly hacked off and a little worried and it really helps the story so every now and again stuff like that happens and it, it's always a happy accident and it always helps see now i imagine that a number of our listeners are immediately going to download that episode <laughs> i can see that it's still available so oh yeah um a skatepod we've got a couple of holes in the back catalog due to rights issues but i think pseudopod we've got a full house all the way back yeah, no, I know, I know there are a number of podcasts that do kind of get rid of their archives or on occasion, you know, only put them available to paying customers. But I, I think it's useful to be able to kind of scan the archives also just to see how podcasts have evolved. I mean, that might be good for people looking at starting out, <laughs> you know, li listen to some of your favorite podcasts, listen to what they were like at the beginning, and that will give you hope that you'll get better. Oh, absolutely. Uh, I mean, one of my, my colleagues, Mel Averty, who I took over with, took over from on Pseudopod, who now um, works with us on Mothership Zeta and a couple of, uh, a couple of other projects that are coming out quite soon, Mer likes to refer to her podcasting old lady Kate because she was she's been active in the field a very, very long time. And her show I should be writing, I think is up around five, six hundred episodes at this point. And she has and I, I love this. She has literally written the book on how to podcast. If you look at her bibliography, one of the things in there is a guide to podcasting. And one of the things that she advocates is record five or six zero episodes. Record stuff where you have a pretty good idea of what you want to do, but you're still figuring it out. Because if you do that, you'll make some mistakes and you'll also get more comfortable with it. And you don't have to put those up, but it will mean that when you do decide to fully launch, you can either launch six to seven episodes in and go, so these first six, this was when we were figuring it out. Or come in sounding really good and then roll those into the feed later as a reminder of how things used to be. And it it works. I mean, this is a, I, I love this field because you learn by accretion. You're always getting better. And even in the areas of it, we work in at Pseudopod is fundamentally hopeful. So I, I, I really respond to that. I think as well, a good idea in terms of recording, let's say five or six episodes is just to see, you know, is this something 
you actually want to do because you might be initially enthusiastic but you know get 10 episodes in and think actually this isn't quite for me or you might think oh the editing that takes a long oh. time i'm not sure that i you know want to oh. commit to this <laughs> absolutely uh i mean you as as you guys know this is a serious time commitment uh and if if it's not something which you enjoy don't do it and yeah audio editing is one of those those things which i know enough to do and i'm also incredibly grateful that i have friends and colleagues who are much much better at it than i am my all-time record for audio editing where back when i did that for the show was a 25 minute story with about 54 separate continuity errors in it. and each one was marked in fairness to the narrator but I was brand new at the time, and as a result of that, and as a result of just how much of this thing needed to be rebuilt, uh, that 25-minute story took a full working day to edit. And it was, in fact, so bad. Uh, it was such a huge amount of work that Ben stood me down from audio editing after that. He was like, you shouldn't have to go through this. It's fine. Seriously. Uh, and I didn't have to do anything else up any other form of audio after that going forward. So I have the utmost respect for people who can do that because it is just a huge amount of work. But looking back at when you started out podcasting, if you could do it again now, what is it that you would do differently and what are some of the biggest lessons you've learned from podcasting? That's a very good question. What I would do differently is I think I would structure slightly more. It took me a few months to settle into the routine I have now, where I'll write up an end cap beforehand, I'll revise it once, and then uh, record it. So a few of the early ones are quite raw, not in terms of content, just in terms of how, how they're presented. And I, I could do better at that. In terms of lessons, I would probably say I, I would like to maybe have learnt earlier just how much this can help. And by help, I mean help the people doing it. Uh, I mean, I, I, that's always happened with everybody. I had a couple of periods in my life around kind of the middle of my first decade. That feels so odd to say. My first decade with Pseudopod. Around the middle of my first decade with Pseudopod, where things in my life weren't really weren't very good at all. And these all kind of self-corrected out very nicely. Uh, but they self-corrected out at a point where I was three or four months, or where, uh, you know, when, when one of my best friends was three or four months behind on the show. So, and I was working in the same office as her at, at the time, and, and she, we, we'd chat on the, on the walk-in, and, and she'd give me a lift across to the town where the building was. And so she knew I was, I was good. You know, I was happy. I was living somewhere new. Everything was, was working out quite nicely. And then one morning, um, I go to York Railway Station where she'd pick me up. She opens the door to the car and goes, what the hell happened in April? And I was like, you mean the show? Yeah, yeah, that wasn't a good month. And it was starting to bleed through into the end caps. And it was not, I mean, you know, I, I wasn't bleeding on air or anything. I wasn't airing any, any, any of the stuff that was going on in my life explicitly. It's just... When you're under pressure and when you're under stress for a long period of time, it affects your outlook. It affects how you write. It affects how you sound. And it very much affected how I wrote and sounded at that point. But it did it in a good way because it was a way to, to vent, a way to deal with the stress in a manner which wasn't confessional, but at the same time was very helpful. And strangely, because I was in quite a dark place and it's a horror show, it kind of helped. So I would I'd be more aware of that lesson early on if I could. And the other thing I would do my best to learn early on is rely on other people more. I mean, we, we have a, we're incredibly lucky escape artists. We have four brilliant teams of people. And a lot of the reason why we have that is because of how Pseudopod was when it first started out. I mean, we're, we're a company who's accreted together. You know, Pseudopod was launched because Ben, Steve wanted a horror show, likewise Podcastle, and the organizational structures behind the scenes have taken a very long time to wrangle into place. 
So for the longest time, Superpod was literally me and them. And that was an awful lot of work. And now it's not. I would really love to be able to kind of go back in time and talk to early years Pseudopod me and go, you don't have to do all of this. Neither of you do. There are people out there who can help. Oh, uh, yeah, I can certainly relate to that and also relate to the power of delegation, the power of asking people for help. I don't know, sometimes we think that we have to prove something but the only body the only person we're really proving it to is ourselves and then we're usually just proving that we can get very burnt out and we're being a little bit silly but (laughs) absolutely i mean what what you said about those dark months and it bleeding into your work on pseudopod i mean i think as a listener sometimes we appreciate that honesty and that authenticity um particularly if it's done in the right way and it it makes you as a podcaster and as a human being just more relatable well thank you it i always try and be honest i think is is the best possible way i can i can express it and sometimes honesty isn't isn't very nice i would rather sometimes honesty doesn't look very good but i mean i I grew up in a house which was defined very much so by, well, let's not quite look this in the eyes because then eventually it will leave. And I mean, there was nothing explicitly horrible in my childhood. My folks are lovely people. My my dad narrates for us every second month, for God's sake. But I grew up in the 1980s and I was a a kid of a teacher and a nurse. So, you know, I know for a fact some of the only people who had more adolescent stress than I did were the kids of minors and police officers, you know? And it took a very long time for me to accept that repressing the points where that was causing me damage was causing me more damage. And Pseudopod was the big spot where I started to be able to deal with a lot of the things I was carrying around. I mean, you know, there was, like I said, there was um, ongoing mental health uh, concerns with one of my parents throughout the end of their professional career. And they're fine now. They were fine then. But this corresponded neatly with the point in my adolescence where I had a choice. And, you know, I could go have a traditional adolescence or I could be a working studious kid who hit every mark. I went for option two. And that meant I didn't have very much of a release. It was that. I was. Uh, I lost a very close friend at a very early age, at around the same time. There was a whole bunch of stuff that hit in my late 30s that was a... God, I can legitimately say late 30s now. Wow. 18-year-old me is shaking shaking his head. And his <laughs> mullet, I might add. <laughs> going, mullet, how? Brilliant. And how? Uh, and, you know, there was all, all this stuff which I was just pushing down and pushing down and pushing down. And it wasn't taking anymore. So the show was how I was able to deal with it. And not in an accusatory way, not, you know, pointing fingers at me. Don't do that. It was just, it's how I cope. And I'm immensely relieved that it ended up being something and continues to be something positive, not just for me, but for other people. So that's genuinely a really nice thing to hear. Yeah, and I think it's testament to the hard work and to the quality of the show that recently our listeners and our readers have voted Pseudopod the fiction podcast of the year. So there's a lot of people, you know, cheering you on and listening. That means so much to all of us as well, because, I mean, especially the short list, guys. You know, I mean, the, 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 the short list we were on, I looked down that and I was like, listen to them, listen to them, they're all great, and us. And it, it means so much for the hard work of the entire team to be recognized like that, and especially to be recognized in that particular peer group, because we're, we're a weird company. I mean, we've, we've been around slightly longer than what we do, and... It's been very strange seeing all these other shows kind of spring up in our in our kind of bailiwick in, in, in our neighborhood. 
And at times it's been a little frustrating seeing how much attention they get. I mean, there was a point in 2016 where you could set your watch by how often there would be a article in The Guardian about cereal. You know? And it's like, oh, there's an article about how cereal's revolutionizing podcasting. It's Tuesday. And when you have a decade's worth of experience in the field, and you're looking at folks with two, three years, or one year, or whatever, just going off like a rocket in front of you, that can be a little bit disheartening. But what we've been able to do is not get down about it, which I'm really proud of. And not just for my own occasional kind of self-deprecating tendencies, but the team as a whole. Because it's just fundamentally, it's about the work. You've got to keep doing the work, and the work's got to be as good as humanly possible. And I'm a firm believer in learning by accretion. I'm a firm believer in how you get better by doing what you do and by listening to other people do what they do. And, I mean, I'm a huge Black Tapes and Tannis fan, and Rabbits, their, their new mm. podcast in is just fantastic. Everyone on that shortlist is sending in brilliant work. And we listen to all of them. And being voted your fiction podcast of the year from that group, that feels like it feels earned. You know, I, I'm on behalf of everybody. I'm really, really thankful. Thank you. So, thank you, folks, and thank you to the listeners as well. Absolutely. I was just going to say it was a hotly contested category that one, wasn't it? So, um, yeah. You know, some sometimes you kind of, you know, you can get a general gist of which way a category is going to go, but sometimes it's just too close to call. And I think this was one of them, and it was a richly deserved award. I would have said, thank not you. a doubt. Yeah, and I'm I'm really actually I'm really glad that the, that was hotly contested because I mean I this, this is a really fun time to be doing what we do. I mean, Ed, Ed, my my routine every morning is wake up, make the coffee, re refresh the podcatcher, and there's always something really fun. And about three days out of five, there's always something really fun and kind of horror fiction related in in my feed. So it, it's a it's a real pleasure to be in, in this field right now, in particular. So I really really want to do something tabletop role playing games that takes really a lot I could do things with that mm. but you said there was a time where you know you'd look at the newspaper or online news stories and you'd see something about cereal and I mean the other day one of my friends has recently started a podcast was asking me about downloads for this is horror and demographics and I said well I, I can give you that information if you want but I think it's always good whether you're writing whether you're podcasting to compare yourself to yourself look if you're getting better because like yeah. I mean it, imagine if I started basing like the this is horror show stats on how well the Joe Rogan or the Tim Ferriss podcast is is doing exactly. that. Exactly. You know, I, I, I would stop doing this. But So all I need to do is look at, am I improving? Am I providing value? And, you know, to be honest, even if you've got a relatively small audience, if you have people telling you how much value you're providing, that goes a long, long way. Absolutely. You you absolutely nailed it. The, and I mean, this is something which we talk about quite a lot in our editorial meetings, because it's so easy to get caught in that trap of constantly comparing yourself to other people. And you can't. And I mean, especially with podcasting, because it's, it genuinely is a community in so many ways. It's, it doesn't feel competitive. And as a result of that, as ultimately the only people that you're really competing with are yourself and you've just got to as you say you just got to keep going you just have to keep improving and as long as you're doing that as long as you have an audience and even if that audience is five people you have an audience you're doing great every now and again we get direct feedback and uh it's always incredibly gratifying when we do i mean sometimes we get folks who <laughs> will email us and go why the hell did you run that and we always try and engage with them and explain the editorial thinking behind it. And sometimes we get people, we email us and go, thanks, you guys really help. Uh, I mean, the, the stupid Alistair teaches himself how to cook 
blog posts and pseudopod are two things I've actually, I've actually been contacted by a couple of veterans about who've gone, I had some trouble adjusting when I came back and you making jokes about how bad your cookies are and the show really helped keep doing that. And I mean, that makes you stand six inches taller. You know, if, if you're helping someone else at the same time as having fun, and that's the fundamental thing, this shit is fun. Mm. Then that's the best thing in the world, you know? Yeah. And if you have people who are taking the time to email you, even if it's to say, why did you run that? It's like, wow, people care. <laughs> you know? Exactly. Exactly. I mean, yeah, even, even negative feedback. I'm, I'm reminded of, of that, that lovely moment in, uh, the, in the Tim Burton movie about Ed Wood, the thing where he's on the phone, like, oh, you saw my new film. What do you think? You hated it. You thought it was the worst film you've ever seen. Well, you'll like the next one better, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, again, just to continue the weird Johnny Depp motif, it's, you know, Pirates of the Caribbean. I mean, you are without a doubt the worst pirate I've ever heard of, but you have heard of me, you know? <laughs> and as, as long as you've got that, that's enough, man, you know? <laughs> there's no bad publicity. A lot of the time, no. There's, there's, there's no. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes, you know, I mean, a, a headline which, which involves the words podcaster sets fire to and any form of small animal, I'm guessing that's not going to be good, but <laughs> everything else. So, I mean, at this point, what goals do you have for the future of Pseudopod and Escape Artists? What is it that you'd like to do in the future? Two or three things. We had to dry dock Mothership Zeta, the magazine we launched last year, which we were really sad to see happen. But that was an experiment, and it was one which, from a creative point of view, was immensely successful, and from a fiscal point of view, wasn't. We basically set a budget for it and got to the point where that budget had been exhausted and it couldn't sustain itself without that. So we, like I say, we brought that into land. We're looking at ways to bring back MZ at the moment. Um, whether or not that says a brand or as a magazine is something which we're still trying to figure out. Uh, we have two or three ideas for new shows, which are in this perpetual neck and neck horse race. I'm, I'm, this is one of those situations where I'm hesitant to go into too much detail in case it suddenly magically doesn't happen. But with, I mean, the areas we're looking at are we're looking at doing some kind of a nonfiction show. We're really interested in kind of long form work at the moment. We've got a situation where there are three or four long form stories of various genres, actually, that have been presented to us, and we're trying to figure out the best possible way to present those to listeners. And I mean, there are a couple of ideas which are always a little bit further out. We talk quite regularly about a crime show. Uh, the issue being, as near as we can tell, short crime fiction isn't that common. And we talk quite regularly about a comedy show. And the issue there sometimes is that short comedy is immensely common, but it's quite difficult to zero in on the stuff that's really great. So, I mean, that's the next two to, th two to five years in terms of long-form project. In terms of other stuff, we are looking very seriously at ways to uh, kind of expand out our back catalogue. Yeah, we're looking at curated collections from editors and hosts for back catalogue stuff. And we're also looking at um, getting some new merchandise out in the world as well. Uh, we're also hoping to increase our con presence. I mean, both Marguerite and I are going to be at Helsinki at Worldcon. We have a couple of people at US cons coming up as well, I think. And really trying to do two things at once i mean i we took over as head as company heads three years ago and we're kind of three years into a five-year renovation plan so what we're trying to do is maintain and strengthen the foundation of the company and look for ways for it to expand and those are really the two places which we're focusing on at the moment i mean i can tell you our end goal and and we would kind of love this is um we we did a staff survey uh, just after Christmas and one of the questions on there was what would be your ultimate victory condition your kind of epic win and uh, about a third of the people who responded said it would be great if we got a Hugo nomination someone else came up with you know um, 
nebulas. Someone else wanted us to do print anthologies, and we actually have one of those coming out with Pseudopod, thanks to the Kickstarter. Uh, and the one at the very bottom was Escape Artists Convention. And I would love that. Even if it was just like a one-day thing somewhere, I would absolutely love that. That and live shows. I, I've been really, really chuffed to see how well No Sleep Podcast's live tour has been doing. I'd love to try something like that. Yeah, I mean, I would love to attend something like that. Obviously, being in Japan, that might, you know, require a lot of financing. But it certainly sounds like something to work towards, for sure. It, it's, it would be really cool if we could pull that off. And I mean, it's weird. You, you, you say it might be difficult to attend because you're based in Japan, but we have people all over the world which I'm aware if I put slightly different emphasis on that would be much more threatening than it's, it's meant. So, you know, I'll, I'll stick with the kind of innocent reading of it. <laughs> we have people all over the world. Um, no, I mean, we have sound engineers in Australia. We have a couple of people in uh, the middle of Europe. We have a huge contingent, obviously, in the US. And, but our hope is eventually to be able to kind of unite everybody in, in one spot and, and really confirm this weird kind of podcasting's version of the Avengers thing that we seem to have going on. And I mean, I, like I said, ramen capital of the planet. I'd love to go to Japan. Mm. My show in Japan would be a dream come true. You say that until you have to sleep on Michael's floor and then the, the, <laughs> world, the world will get dark. Believe me. <laughs> uh, th this is a, a hor this is a completely irrelevant aside, but it does remind me of something. During my, my previous life as a comics and games retailer, and I will spare my boss's blushes by not naming him, uh, the chain I worked for uh, attended the UK version of Gen Con, the big gaming convention. And we were a tiny company at this point. We had two sites and I think 10 staff between them. And the end of Friday night, the boss emailed in and went, look, you've all been working really hard, and I know we've had to go down to the convention three or four days early. So I tell you what, I've got your comp tickets. Come on down. You can stay over and go to the con, and it will be great. And we were like, oh, thanks, boss. So we all pile in the car. We drive down to Loughborough, or Luga Baruga, as a friend of mine calls it even <laughs> now. And we are met at the front gates of Loughborough University by two things. The first is a man dressed as a colonial marine, who would still be dressed as that colonial marine three days later when we left. The second is my boss who takes us to one side and goes, welcome, this is, I swear, hand on a stack of Bibles, this is exactly what he said. Welcome to the con, lads. I hope you have a really good time. By the way, I've not paid your entries. The entire company will be thrown out if anyone finds you here without a wristband, and we don't have any more rooms, so you'll be sleeping on my floor. <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck? A chill <laughs> fills the courtyard. My, my then direct boss looks at him and goes, I'm sorry, what? And <laughs> This phrase, this phrase and this exact emphasis on it has echoed in my brain for years. My boss grins all over his face and goes, don't worry, guys, it'll be an adventure. <laughs> <laughs> and oh, he slept five, five people in one room for three days. And uh, Mike, my, my manager at the time, later told me that he spent two of those nights lying awake listening to me and the owner of the company snore in off harmony. Trying to work out which one of us he would murder first. <laughs> so glad I, I don't work in retail anymore. I cannot even tell you. So, sleeping on floors, uh, I, if it comes to it, I can do. Just don't ask me to snore in harmony. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> don't worry, lads. It'll be an adventure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to use that. I hope I won't get punched in the face when I use it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh oh dear <laughs> i mean what what makes it so insulting and so incredible is just the fact that you know you only found all of this information out once you arrived <laughs> yeah exactly oh we also um still ended up helping break the stall down afterwards in the convention we weren't allowed to be in. that was special but 
I did briefly score a six and a half foot long cardboard Enterprise D out of the deal. So I didn't come away empty handed. Right. <laughs> so you probably have a contingency now to where when you have to go travel or something. Because I've been in similar situations with uh, things, especially like on college, because I uh, played with the uh, with the college uh, musical group that you had to kind of like have a contingency plan if they sent you somewhere. So, OK, so how much am I responsible for? Where am I staying? Who am I staying with? And what do I have to do while I'm there? Absolutely. Because we got because you get hosed the first time and you're like going, wait a second. This is supposed to be for one day. I have a test tomorrow. You know, absolutely. <laughs> and, and so, I mean, yeah. The, the added advantage I have is um, my, my partner is Californian and uh, is a former paralegal, now active lawyer. So there are certain things that she will not do. And <laughs> the first time we met, actually, because we dated for we, we met through the show and we dated for 18 months across the Atlantic, thanks to FaceTime. And the end of 2011, she came over for three weeks and uh, as we <laughs> like to describe it, she was immensely relieved I wasn't a sex criminal, and I was immensely relieved she wasn't a bearded trucker grad. And we <laughs> clicked instantly, and she'd bought a rail pass so we could go anywhere in the country for three weeks. So one day, we were bored, and she went, you want to go to Edinburgh? And we did. And we went all the way up to Edinburgh. This was end of November, start of December. And uh, we walked out of Waverley Station, where Avengers Infinity War is currently <laughs> shooting, by the way, for some reason. And uh, this glacial wind blows down the canyons of Edinburgh town, hits us. I, I swear, I'm wearing four layers of clothing, and it feels like I'm wearing none. And she just looks at me, looks at the, looks at the weather, and goes, screw this. And an hour later, we were in a hotel. So, I mean, I'm, <laughs> I'm very, very lucky because I, I get to travel with her. Firstly, because she's great and I love her. And secondly, because I have never seen someone weaponize American good nature quite so successfully. <laughs> she, she, she is just magnificent. I've seen her go into hotel rooms and go, what can you give me for this? And then half an hour later, we've got a room that I wouldn't be let near without her. You know, I, so I, I just I go along for the ride and the ride is always way more fun. Well, that's the way you do it. You get somebody who has their has their their finger on the pulse of what they need. Absolutely. And you, and you hang with them. <laughs> Absolutely. But when you were talking about the plans for the future of escape artists, I mean, you mentioned a number of potential shows that I'd definitely be interested in, and I wanted to talk a little bit about. So, I mean, one of the things you said was long-form stories. So mm -hmm. w do you think, would you do that as a kind of, episodic story would you consider an audio drama so i guess more along the lines of the black tapes and tannis that we mentioned earlier or at the moment is it a case of kind of everything is on the table in terms of long form fiction honestly right now pretty much everything's on, on the table there's a couple of projects we're looking at that would be full cast audio dramas and that's not new ground for us. Um, Cast of Wonders did the first of a brilliant set of YA novellas called Camp Myth that way, uh, which is a summer camp for mythical creatures. And it's, the, the, it's got that kind of slightly Harry Pottery element, but it's got a very, very distinct slant on it. And that was really successful for them. And uh, I know they have the rights to the second one of those because I'm in it. And that as full cast audio works really, really well. There's a, I mean, there's a huge amount to do with it. It's far more stitching together, but it's very worthwhile. Uh, there's a couple of novellas we're looking at, which would be serialized readings. And there's a couple of really left of field things, which I unfortunately cannot go into in any great detail, but which would involve ad adaptation work as well as potentially a full cast audio drama. So we are really looking at everything. Well, we will be following things closely and looking out for developments. Brilliant. All right. Thank you for listening to part one of our interview with Alistair Stewart. We'll be back next week with part two where we delve deeper into Pseudopod. 
we talk about Alistair's favourite pseudopod stories and we really look at what it is that he's looking for in terms of submissions to pseudopod and what he thinks makes a good submission. So, so an awful lot of value for anyone who is hoping to be published by pseudopod. And if you would like to access part two now, then you can do so over on Patreon, www.patreon.com forward slash this is horror. We've put part two up very early indeed. So, I mean, we always say you'll get the episode 24 hours in advance, but you pledge a dollar now, you're getting it a week in advance. I mean, another incentive to pledge to our Patreon in April is that we're having an extreme summer of podcasting. So for every $10 or two patrons that we gain in April, we're going to record an extra episode over the summer. And we announced this last week, already around $100 up. So provided that we don't lose any of that money, that's an extra 10 episodes guaranteed already. So there's going to be a lot of content for you to look forward to over the summer. A lot of people we're going to be interviewing. Who do you want to hear? Let me know. Drop me an email. Michael at thisishorror.co.uk Or tweet me at Wilson the Writer. If enough people request a certain author, editor, or indeed anyone, we'll do our best to make it happen. So do let us know. If you've got a topic that you want to hear a number of writers talk about as per the Writer's Craft Talk episodes, let me know that too. Because we value your feedback. It's very much two ways. If you have something that you want to hear, or perhaps if there's something we're doing that you'd like a little bit less of, let us know. Because we want to make the podcast as good as possible. And we need your help for that. Before I wrap up, a quick word from our sponsors. Massive reptilian monsters have begun to emerge from Mexico's volcanoes, wreaking havoc on city after city. Now the nation's only hope is for physicist Elena Bass and anthropologist Alfonso Becerra to overcome their long-standing feud and work together. For only a blend of science and myth can save Mexico from the ancient lords of the earth. Available in ebook and paperback from Severed Press, Lords of the Earth is a harrowing Mexican kaiju novel from award-winning writer David Bowles. People of the Sun, a dark fantasy sci-fi thriller, will be available from Sinister Grin Press in paperback and ebook on March 15th. All life comes from the sun. Sometimes death comes with it. Brimming with action and intrigue, People of the Sun is sure to entice fans of Watchmen and I Am Number 4. Mirror Matter Press has now merged with Sinister Grin Press to bring you horror, sci-fi, fantasy, adventure, and more. www.sinistergrinpress.com To wrap up, quick quote from Seneca. It's not because things are difficult that we dare not venture. It's because we dare not venture that they are difficult. So if there's something you're thinking about doing something you're thinking about writing and you're afraid and if you are that's okay it's okay to be afraid but I challenge you and Seneca challenges you to venture start that project that is frightening you start that project that you've been putting off because it doesn't look like an easy path Start that project and you might just be amazed at how far you get and at what you can achieve. We'll be back next week with Alistair Stewart. And remember, you want early access? Patreon.com forward slash this is horror. Until next time, look after yourself. Be good to one another. Read horror and have a great Great day.